Thank you for joining us this morning. We will begin shortly, ensuring other members have logged in to participate. Thank you for joining GSBA's health and wellness web series, Keeping It Real, with host Lindsay T. H. Jackson. GSBA is Washington State's LGBTQ and LA Chamber of Commerce and the largest LGBTQ chamber in North America, representing over 1,400 small businesses, corporate and nonprofit members who share the values of promoting equality and diversity in the workplace. GSBA's health and wellness web series, Keeping It Real, will help individual leaders and organizations speak up, speak out, and move closer to reaching their full potential. Please take a minute to complete the survey at the end of the webinar. If you're on the Zoom platform, you will be re redirected to the survey. If you're joining us on Facebook Live, the link will be provided in the chat box. Remember to like and share this webinar on your social media also. Today's episode is titled, The Unspoken Reality of Trans Health. Here's Keeping It Real host, Lindsay T.H. Jackson. Malaysia Booker, 23. Johanna Medina Leon, 25. Kiki Fontroy, 21. B-Love Slater, 23. Nikki Kunhausen, 17. Carly Vijay, age unknown. La Becky, 52. Brian Sanchez Zoretti, 20. Alexa Luciano Ruiz, 24. Serena Angelique Velasquez, 32. Leila Pilez, 21. Selena Reyes Hernandez, 37. Patsy Andrea Delgado, 42. And the list goes on. These are names that I think, that we think it is important that you know. In the midst of talking about all the lives that we have lost, in the Black community, there are names that we often forget to mention, to honor, to hold, to say out loud. And those are the names of the lives lost in our trans family, in our trans community. Say their names, say their names again, and say them again. Today, I'm joined on the virtual couch by Maddie Mooney, who is the Healthcare Access Manager at Ingersoll Gentler Center, and by Dr. Kevin Wang, who has created an innovative program at Swedish Medical Center that is helping to improve LGBTQ healthcare via training programs for residents who will eventually be treating you, me, and other members of our trans family, our community. I find myself already emotional 
as I should be when I lead with the names of individuals who have been lost to us, and yet we are not talking about it. We are not speaking about it nearly enough. Today's episode, we are taking a strong lens on trans health and trans health under threat. Maddie Mooney, Dr. Kevin Wang, come off of mute. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much. Maddie, you know, I, I feel inclined to just delve right deep into the topic, but before we do that, I would love to hear a little bit from you about your background and how it is that you uh, came to your work at Ingersoll and, and what drives and motivates that work? Um, so in general, I've been in the healthcare field for over 10 years. Um, what brought me to Ingersoll is that I was experiencing um, a fair amount of uh, homophobia and transphobia where I was before um, and the opportunity came up uh, and I really resonated with the values and mission of Ingersoll Gender Center. Um, I applied and the rest is history, but um, I think that what drives me in the work is that um, as a trans person myself, I'm really committed to using the opportunities that I have and the privilege that I have and um, the voice that I have um, to advocate for um, my trans brothers and sisters and siblings um, and make sure that we um, all have access to self-determination, all have access to quality health care. Um, yeah. What is the mission at Ingersoll? Well, that's something that I would have to look up. <laughs> you, don't, you don't have to say it verbatim, but I guess uh, on a given day, what is it that you feel that you are out there meant to be doing? Well, I think some of the values at Ingersoll are, are things like courageous authenticity, um, radical inclusivity, um, anti-racism, things like that. Um, those are things that, that are some of my personal values. And so um, it's really exciting for me to have a workplace where I can live out my personal values um, in the work that I do. When you spoke about some of your lived experience that brings you uh, to Ingersoll and also your passion for this work in general, um, can you can you tell us? And you know, I want to name as a cis black woman. I. I've obviously spent the week uh, down rabbit hole after rabbit hole studying, and yet I am so aware of my ignorance. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience growing up? Um, to be honest, I don't really like to talk about uh, my upbringing, my personal upbringing. Um, Thank but I guess a brief cliff notes. Uh, uh, my dad is African. Um, and so that was definitely a part of um, something that, that helped make the, the Maddie you see today. Um, my stepmother was Indian um, from India. And so we just had a very, um, I wanna say, restricted childhood in a lot of ways. Um, and that definitely um, <clears throat> affected um, my coming out process a little bit, at, at, at the very least coming out as trans. I didn't come out uh, as trans to my dad uh, and my stepmom until literally the day before my top surgery, which was July 8th of last year. Um, but I definitely uh, had a little bit more courage uh, coming out as queer when I was, I don't know, God, 
like in the eighth grade or something like that. I think my dad thought it was a phase. Um, and so it wasn't too much of a big deal, but, um, but yeah, that's kind of my like trans queer story. I think that my, what's interesting is, like I said, my dad is, is from, from Africa, uh, a very generally conservative um, type person. Um, our relationship actually got better uh, after I came out as trans, uh, which is really, really weird. I think that if I had known uh, that that was the case, I probably would have come out as trans a long time ago, but uh, but I didn't, and and <laughs> and here we are. But I'm I'm glad that uh, I'm able to live authentically around my family. I think that that's something that I haven't been able to do for a long time. I always. Um, used to tell my family, used to tell kind of people when they would ask why um, I'm not that close with my family. I'd always tell them, well, they don't really know me. Um, mm. and, you know, and it, and it was true. They didn't really know me. I think that uh, right now at 35, my, my family is literally just getting to know who I am. And that's, um, that's a very slightly sad, but a little jarring, right? Because I've been around these people for my whole life and um, at no time in that time frame have they ever known who the real Maddie was. Um, mm. so, yeah, mm. Kind of getting to, wanna, getting to know each other again. I wanna, strangely, I wanna stop you there mm. because you gave me a very clear boundary and I wanna respect that. And so thank you for sharing what you did share. And I don't want you to feel inclined to keep sharing. Yeah. Uh, if it feels well, uncomfortable. Yeah. <laughs> In uh, recent weeks even, we had this situation where on one side, we felt like the Supreme Court handed down a uh, major win um, in honoring that our um, efforts for many, many years to uphold uh, rights in the workplace, rights in our communities under the Civil Rights Act, that that did include LGBTQ and IA recognition in our Civil Rights Act, and yet almost in the same week, it felt like the Trump administration had signed a piece of legislation saying that doctors were able to uh, make their own decisions in terms of how we um, provide healthcare and choose based on their own beliefs whether or not to provide someone with healthcare. I'm gonna open this up to both you, uh, Dr. Kevin Wang and Maddie. Not that I'm asking you to somehow be in their heads, but how is it that we can do that in the same week? On one side, uh, it feels like we're winning, and on the other side, it feels like we just took 200 steps backwards. Like, explain to this dumb person here, how the hell does that happen? I honestly don't know how that happens. I think <laughs> that one thing I can tell you is that um, this ruling, uh, this ruling is horrible. And also doctors were already making their own decisions about who they were going to see or who they weren't going to see or who they were going to provide uh, health care to or who they weren't going to provide health care to or whether that health care was gender affirming or um, sexual orientation affirming or any of that stuff. Um, I think that, um, that's one of the reasons why Ingersoll is around, right? Because we know that um, since the beginning of time, um, trans folks, queer folks, gay folks, uh, et cetera, haven't really had the greatest, um, the greatest access to healthcare, right? They've always had to deal with barriers to, um, to accessing that care. Um, and, and finding medical providers who, um, who are respectful of, of their identities. Yeah, yeah. So, so did you? 
Yeah, if I may, um, I think a lot of us sort of had the same perplexed feeling. I mean, I think mind you probably could hear exploding heads as you know the week of great wins with the Supreme Court ruling Title VII protections for queer individuals and, and populations. And then you have Health and Human Services announcing their final revised rule of Section 1557 of the Affordable Care Act, which is the anti-discrimination clause. And I think it speaks to a couple things. One, it really does speak to separation of the different branches of our government, right? So you do have the Supreme Court, which is saying, no, this is illegal. You can't do anything about it. On the other hand, you have a federal administration who um, is attacking marginalized populations in the midst of a public health crisis. And what I find to be particularly interesting is this is history repeating itself over and over again. And if you see in the history of um, disease outbreaks, targets and attacks against marginalized populations is the norm and not the exception. So just to do a little bit of a history lesson, right, in the 1300s, you had the Jewish population being targeted for the bubonic plague. You had Mexicans who were being blamed for uh, the H1N1 epidemic. You had Haitians who were being blamed for bringing HIV into the United States. Um, and right now, during the coronavirus public health outbreak, you have in certain countries internationally who are blaming the queer community for the cause of coronavirus. And you have here in the United States where for the first time ever during a disease outbreak, there is no anti-discrimination task force led by the federal government. And so um, how this happened, I have no, well, maybe I do have a few ideas, but um, it, it's really not surprising. And so how is it possible where you have the Supreme Court who had this great ruling for the protections for the first time, federal protections for LGBT plus people. And then you have another branch of the government saying, nope, we're going to remove protections for LGBTQI plus people. We're not going to help support those with limit, limited English proficiency. It is just very, very mind blowing. However, it's still, forward movement, which I'm, I'm really excited from our Supreme Court. And I'm hoping in November, things will change to the point where we will continue to make progress in bringing equity to marginalized populations. Yes, yes. I mean, Sorry for the rant. I apologize. We love a rant. All of, and everybody who watches the show can tell you it's mostly me ranting every week. Um, oh, if, you, it, if, if I may, just real quick, just because um, I just wanted, I just want this out there. Maddie is amazing and I am so grateful to be on this panel with you, Maddie. So love, love, love to you and Lindsay and uh, GSBA. Thank you so much for this opportunity. So thank you. Oh, thank you. I know I would like to just sit back and listen and let you and Maddie run this. Uh, today, which I think is a good lesson to, you know, uh, every person that deigns to be the host every once in a while, sometimes your job is just to shut up and listen. So Maddie and Kevin, I'm going to do a lot of shutting up and listening today. Um, can you speak about how um, your upbringing, Kevin, led to the development of the work that you are now doing? Because it's been quite a journey that developed, I won't say organically, in that it just was, oh, every step on the journey was easy, and they just, you know, listened and gave it, but there was a momentum that started from a very young age that led to the development of the work you're doing now. Take us yeah. back to that cold night when you were <laughs> born. Um, so, you know, I'm, you know, I don't know if I'm just dating myself. I'm just a little older than Maddie. Um, and, you know, I never really I'm knew. A lot older than me. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, by, both of you look flawless, by the way. Um, <laughs> I, um, you know, I never really knew what it meant when I was younger, just because um, back then it was a little bit different in terms of visibility of LGBT plus folks on television and the news or anything. And if anything, and you and I talked about this before on TV, it was, you know, on Three's Company and gay people were made fun of and 
The only time I really saw any kind of positive gay figure was on Roseanne with the diner or the owner of the diner. And, you know, and then in eighth grade, I had this mad crush on my eighth grade science teacher, Mr. Robert Piles. If you're hearing this, just to let you know, I love you. Um, Piles. Hello. Um, but for me, it, it was, you know, it was kind of a, you know, I mean, it, it kind of really was a, a, a very fortunate path and it really was an organic thing, right? So my mom had heart surgery when she, when I was younger. So I knew I wanted to go into medicine because now I have this vibrant, energetic parent, right? And then, um, you know, going to my family doctor's office and he keeps asking me, so are you dating any girls? Have any girls caught your eye? And I just thought, oh, well, maybe liking guys isn't the right thing. And then, um, realizing, oh, maybe there are, uh, there are others similar to me who have the same thoughts and, and passions and desires. And it wasn't until I was in med school where we had a one hour lecture to hear about the entire LGBT plus community, which is you know, just one hour, which is insane. Um, you know, they asked where gay people live and people just thought of the typical places such as Chicago and New York or, you know, um, San Francisco. And then I don't know what prompted me to do it, but I raised my hand and I just said, I'm pretty sure gay people live everywhere because of course, being the selfish person I was back then, maybe still am today, all I thought about were gay people. And, um, and I said, I'm pretty sure gay people live everywhere. And there's one person who's answering the question right now. So the gay person could be your neighbor, a family member, anybody, which kind of threw people off. It was a little bit surprising for them. And as far as I knew, I was the only person who was willing to come out in my class of 272 people, which is a pretty large class uh, for, for, for med school. But what really, um, what really changed it were, were two events in my life. One of which is when I was interviewing for residency programs, um, I knew I wanted to do something related to LGBT plus health. And if there was a program, I thought, oh, this, this place is really great. I would love to live here. I would tell them, hey, I'm gay and I would love to do some sort of work with the LGBT plus community. And there was one interview where I thought things were going great and our body language was really good. We were leaning towards each other and laughing. And then the moment I came out, the person's body language immediately changed. Mm -hmm. The person laid back, leaned back, and they just said, oh, well, I don't, I'm not sure this program is for you. And which was a little bit shocking to me because my experiences prior to have been really great. I've been very, for, I was very fortunate, right? And I just said, well, I'm really sorry. I don't want to waste your time. And I just want to go to a program which will be um, encouraging and accepting. And when I stood up to shake this person's hand, they wouldn't even reach out to, to shake my hand, which I knew was a big red flag. And I just said, this, this, cannot, this cannot be the specialty I'm going into. And so this was one moment where I said, I really, we really need to make sure LGBT plus healthcare is addressed in residency training. Yes. Um, the second thing, which then helped me focus more on um, our further marginalized populations within our LGBT plus family, particularly the intersex and the transgender communities, um, you know, we just don't have a lot. And so my second experience was when I met the very, very amazing Dr. Laura Ellis who is a family physician in Florida who currently works for Disney. Mm -hmm. um, she was the, as far as I know anyway, the first person, uh, the first transgender person I've ever met who also happened to be a family physician. And when she told me everything transgender individuals go through just to access, just to get into, a into the doors of a clinic, let alone getting the healthcare they deserve, was such an eye-opening experience. And I just said, we have to do something about it right now. And so you, those were the sorry. things that really made me want to go down this path, sorry. Yeah, no, the, thank you. I just wanna, can you please uh, share some of those and Maddie, please jump in where uh, it feels appropriate. What are some of those uh, concerns that were highlighted for you and that we know are still major concerns in accessing care. So Maddie, do you want me to start or do you want to go, do you want to go first? I think you're muted, sorry. I am muted. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I, can, 
I can mention a few. I think that uh, historically folks have had to um, live in their gender identity for an extended mm -hmm. amount of time. I think up to up to two years, I think it was before they would even consider uh, hormones or surgery. Um, yeah, I think now uh, folks have to have ridiculous letters uh, from providers, from mental health providers, sometimes from multiple uh, mental health providers. Um, I know that folks have had to get these letters and then a few days before their surgery, insurance companies will be like, oh, well, it's been too much time between you know, the time that you got the first few letters. Now we need new letters and this time from different mental health providers. And that, that creates um, just kind of this like very jarring experience of, of knowing that one, mental health providers cost money. <laughs> um, wow. And two, they're hard to find. Um, and so um, it creates a situation where folks are coming up against all of these barriers just to get surgery or, or sometimes just to get uh, hormones. Um, and, and those are some of the things that, that we work uh, on at Ingersoll. Some of the things that I know that Kevin is very vocal about and advocates for it as well. But you can, um, if you wanna talk about some of the other barriers. Yeah. Um, so the, and again, this is just my, from my experience with reading and learning from shared experiences from my patients. You know, th these certainly aren't experiences I have lived through. Um, but uh, just imagine when you're a patient, regardless of your gender identity or sexual orientation, 50% of transgender individuals have to teach their providers how to do hormonal therapy. Mm. I mean, it's crazy to think you have to do this, right? You know, no one has to teach me how to treat someone's high blood pressure or diabetes. Um, 25 to 33% of patients have had one or more discriminating experiences in the emergency room, right? Where they get frequently misgendered, where they come in because they broke their arm and the provider finds out they have had gender affirming surgical procedures and they say, oh, hey, can I look? Even though it has nothing to do with the care that they should be receiving, which is another triggering experience. Um, they will, uh, I think anywhere from, um, Anywhere from 15 to 60% of patients have overheard disparaging comments made against transgender communities. Um, and, uh, you know, before the Affordable Care Act, before Medicare started covering um, surgical procedures and hormonal therapy, 25 to 50% of procedures and medications were not covered by insurance. And when you look at other aspects, such as other social determinants of health, you have transgender communities who are two to four times higher than the general population to live in poverty. And it is even higher in populations of color. And because of all of the bias against the transgender community, you know, starting, on, starting with early criminalization of LGBT plus folks in the creation, uh, when the United States was started or stolen, um, uh, all of these biases will continue to have their toll on the transgender community. The one statistic which I always emphasize with every uh, resident medical student I teach, the transgender community has nine times the suicide attempt rate than the general population. The general population suicide attempt rate is about four to five percent. This is 36 to 45 percent suicide attempt rate and again more than 50 percent in populations of color. And yes. we know a successful suicide attempt the risk factor for it are, is previous suicide attempts. So we need to make sure all the work and all the advocacy organizations such as Ingersoll is doing needs to be heard because we need to make sure our clinics are not places where we're going to trigger people. Okay, we need to make them inclusive and safe so people can bring their authentic self so we can take care of the entire person. Yes. Right. Another rant. Keep ranting. I just want to uh, center this for somebody who may be listening at home, may be watching on Facebook, and is feeling as though this is an experience that is outside of them. Let's just let's just really listen to what we're hearing right now. Imagine walking into the doctor's office and 
being uh, othered by your doctor in your most vulnerable moment. You are sick or you are um, in need of care that is important for your life, your existence, your personal expression. And your doctor is discriminating against you while you're trying to receive care. While you have the flu, <laughs> for example, they are trying to use this as an opportunity to objectify you and your body. It, it, if you're sitting at home and you are not outraged, you need to watch this episode again and again and again until this marinates down into your cellular level. So just again, Maddie and Dr. Kevin, for the cheap seats, so we're talking about millions of our family, our community members who are having experiences where they are going to receive healthcare, a basic right. <laughs> Is it still? I'm not sure. A basic right in our country. And they are sometimes being turned away by their healthcare provider because their healthcare provider says that despite the Hippocratic oath, right, that they don't want to give treatment or they're needing to educate their health provider. When they have to educate their health provider, do they have to still pay for the session? For the yeah, honestly, they shouldn't. Because <laughs> <laughs> that seems out of, really out of whack for me. Yeah. Do I get your pay for that time? Um, and then also they are basically being assaulted in a sense, sometimes by being asked to expose parts of their body. Like, let's call it what it is. That's, that's assault when you're being told to expose parts of your body that are in no way required. You know, when you're hearing stories like this from people that either come to you, Maddie, via the Ingersoll or uh, Kevin in the clinic, uh, can you just, what is your first response? I, what, I, this is me saying, how would you even respond in those moments? I think that this is a hard question because like how, how do you respond that's going to ever make that behavior okay? Like there's nothing mm -hmm. that's going to make that ever okay. I think that like, <sighs> I feel like being a trans person and talking to a trans person with those experiences and, and I think, I feel like we all have them. Um, it's, it's hard. I think that um, the first thing that I do is, is share that like, I am sorry that that provider felt the need to do that to you. Um, and also, you know, and what else do you say? It's kind of a speechless moment. Um, yes. And it's so common. It's so common. Um, just to give um, a little bit more background, Ingersoll Gender Center did a healthcare access visioning project where we did our own survey of the Seattle community. Um, and we had focus group participants who have felt coerced uh, into procedures that they didn't want. Um, folks had stated that, um, that medical staff specifically um, kind of uh, pushed them into pregnancy tests. Uh, even though they, you know, were, be, were telling, you know, medical staff that they weren't having penetrative sex, um, their partner was not able to impregnate them or they had no partners, um, things like that. Um, folks have had to have, or folks have had procedures or treatments where they haven't fully understood. Um, and I think that uh, the number on that was about 53% um, of trans folks in the Seattle area um, have had procedures where they haven't uh, haven't understood the treatment or procedure um, and haven't really felt uh, comfortable asking for clarification. Um, and so 
we also have like 67% of, of, of participants in our survey said that they uh, were not or not completely comfortable with even speaking with their medical providers about, about their trauma. And I think that what's difficult about creating these barriers within the medical care system is that when you as a patient feel uncomfortable with sharing things about your medical history or about your mental health with your provider, that means that there's care that you're not getting, which yes. increases um, medical disparities for trans uh, individuals. And so it kind of creates this, this system where not only are we not getting consistent or quality care, but we're not sharing the things that we should be able to share with our medical providers. And we're just getting sicker. Um, we're, you know, a lot of us have chronic, um, I think 56% um, of our survey participants said that they identify as chronically ill, sick, or disabled. Um, so when you're unable to go to your doctor about um, a lot of the concerns, the medical concerns that you have, you also have chronically ill folks who are not getting the life-saving care that they need for the chronic illnesses that they have. Um, and so that's really scary. It's really scary. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I think at, at, at least from, from my perspective, I mean, Maddie put it perfectly, which is as somebody who is not a part of the transgender community, these are things where people may not feel comfortable sharing. And if somebody does share it with me, the only thing I can do as, as an ally is certainly acknowledge what they're feeling, um, try to provide as safe of an environment as possible, but there's never, there's never a time I can ever promise somebody this will never happen again. Mm -hmm. And I think acknowledging the trauma which will more, more likely than not occur again in the future, acknowledging it, at least from what my transgender patients have told me, is a little bit of a relief to know I'm not going to be lying to them. I'm not going to say I can make it all better because there's no way any, any of us can make everything 100% better until someone decides to fix the world, right? And being able to provide as inclusive safe of the space as possible is really the best thing we can do as medical care providers in, in a clinical setting. Um, but also just keep in mind, this isn't something we, we should be pushing our patients to share with us because making somebody share these experiences is just making them live through their trauma again. They have to feel comfortable and at a point in their lives when they're able to, to share and process and, you know, let us walk into a, a very vulnerable space for them. So um, I think the, the only thing we can really do at this point is acknowledge and to try to comfort and support them the best way we can. Yes. You had spoken previously <clears throat> about within the medical community, how much uh, work there still is needed in terms of training, in terms of recognizing our own biases. And I uh, watched uh, last night and the night before um, Laverne Cox's Disclosure, which if you're at home tonight, I encourage you, if uh, you want to delve deeper into understanding how our minds are indoctrinated with the with these images, with these scenes in our common media that creates biases and that we have an onus to, to understand the media that we are consuming and understanding how in our greater culture, we have shaped an image of the trans community and how we have almost normalized even violence against the trans community, normalize um, this treatment in our media of the trans community. And one of the things that they really point out in this documentary disclosure is how in uh, government, in media, in schools, that there is a large opportunity to begin rethinking how we're telling stories, rethinking how we're doing education 
how is it, um, Dr. Wang, that we can, as health providers, as policymakers, as teachers, what would you hope is where we might begin with doing our inner work? Gosh, this is a huge question. Um, Sorry, you two. I got I got nothing but huge questions today. <laughs> so also, if I, I have a note here that says Maddie is meant to be saving the world. So uh, <laughs> just want to make sure we're all on the same page with. That. <laughs> so if I if I may just to just to rephrase your question or just to make sure I'm hearing the question correctly, pretty much it's what can we be doing in the healthcare setting to train our our educators to help identify their own biases in order to provide better care is, is am I kind of paraphrasing it correctly? Yes, thank you. Well, I mean, I think the the first step in, 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 in this situation is, I think the folks who do the training have to, one, be open to even admitting they have their own biases. And this is something which is gonna to have to come from within. It is, it, it is you know, we, we often, or actually at, at least for me, I've often heard from my friends who are um, also people of color, you know, my experiences as an Asian American is gonna be very different than somebody who is black, than somebody who, ident who is Latinx. And it is not up to them to teach me on how their life experiences are different than mine. At the same time, these are folks who really have to have the, the, the desire and passion within to say, what is it, I'm, how is it I'm contributing to, a, I mean, essentially a hostile environment, which we are setting up for our LGBTQI plus patients. So I think I would love for people to, to have this desire to do it, everybody to do it. And unfortunately, it's, it's not true. Not everyone really is you know, not everyone's going to admit I have biases and I, and I commit microaggressions on an hourly minute basis, day by day, every single day, right? But, you know, in, 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 an, in, an, in an ideal world, um, you would have people who would want to do it. But the other thing is, with all the increased visibility of marginalized populations and the disparities, each of these um, identities um, um, sort of suffer through, we have a younger generation who um, are much more attuned to these um, biases and how it affects marginalized populations more and more. And mm -hmm. what I'm hoping thing, what I'm hoping is you have these younger people who will, um, who always seem to take the time to do self-reflection and to say, what is it I am doing, which is making things worse for my patients. And I'm hoping they will then in turn influence the older generation of providers who are still there. Honestly, the thing which is really gonna be most helpful is getting the, and I may have to put myself in this category, but we probably have to put our older healthcare providers out to pasture so we can have a fresh new perspective of healthcare providers who are much more attuned to um, the issues at hand. Um, I know it's not a, a, it's a one all solution to the question you asked, um, Unfortunately, I don't have the expertise uh, here in terms of um, how to improve diversity, equity, and inclusion in the healthcare setting. I think Maddie probably, not probably, Maddie has a lot more experience here than I do, but this would be my vision on how things would work within um, healthcare education, where it is a frequent process of self-reflection and personal improvement. Mm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Always starting with that I work. Maddie? I, uh... I teach an amazing implicit bias for medical and mental health providers uh, class if anyone wants to uh, invite me uh, to their facility to do that. Um, but yeah, no, I think that it's really important to, to address implicit bias. I think, like Kevin said, nobody wants to admit that you know they're doing something that's harmful to other people i think that when people think about transphobia and when people think about racism or when people think about homophobia they think about these very virulent like active hatred uh type situations um and a lot of the things that marginalized folks go through are a lot more um a lot more covert than that. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's learning to, 
to recognize, right? That that covert racism, those those implicit biases, those co covert biases, those biases that may not be in your face, um, but that are still kind of ever present. Um, and I think that um, people have a really hard time with acknowledging or addressing those because they think that to have those or to be um, perpetrating harm on people means that they're a bad person in some way. Um, but uh, I don't think that that's necessarily what that means. What I do think that it means though, is when you are aware of your biases, right? And when you're aware of the ways in which um, the ways in which you think affect the lives and the health of other people. I think that when you're aware of that and you continue to do the same things um, that continue to harm and to continue to hurt people, I think that that's what makes uh, your character as a person a little bit questionable. But I think that right now we have people who don't even kind of wanna step into those waters. And I think it's really important for folks to step into those waters. I think a big step into stepping into those waters is introducing more um, programs in medical schools and in medical training regarding um, trans health care, regarding the history of uh, racism in health care, right? Regarding the, the history of homophobia in health care. Um, I think that when we talk about the fact that these things exist and these things contribute to medical disparities for um, medical and healthcare disparities for, for Black folks, for gay folks, uh, for trans folks, um, for, for Black women, um, for all of these different groups. Um, I think that that's when we'll be able to have more honest conversations about how to change, um, change these things. Absolutely. I want to double click on what you just said there, because I think similar when we were talking about um, how to do white allyship a few episodes ago, one of the things we were pointing out was that admitting that you are a racist, that you are homophobic, that you are transphobic, that you are uh, mm -hmm. misogynist, all of that is a part of the culture that we have been marinating in. Okay. And that to admit that you have work to do because you are trying to separate and create space between the messages that you have been indoctrinated with from a very young age, uh, even through or by loving parents, even through well-meaning teachers, well-meaning um, content producers and our television and our cinema, that to be a bad person is to know better and not do better, right? right? the opportunity to step back and, and just own it. And, you know, even um, I had shared with both of you my own um, work this week to just sit in the fact that as someone that grew up in the Black community, the Black community in America is very homophobic and very transphobic. That was the legacy that I was brought up in in the Black church in this country. And that even though, um, you know, my ego wants to say, yeah, but Lindsay, you broke out of that when you were quite young, you know, remember all the times you went to detention in Christian school, aren't you such a good little person? That still, I was marinated in that culture. I still have blind spots right. and that I hope on my final day, I will be defined as somebody that went into my blind spots, that went into my ego and tried to mire my way through it as opposed to trying to hide from it. And so if you're out there listening and, and you're afraid to wade into this, if you are a healthcare provider and you're afraid to wade into your blind spots, then that fear is going to pervade all aspects of your life, first of all. And that the challenge is to stay in owning my shadow, in owning my blind spots. That is what builds my character. I love how you said that, Maddie, that that is when we get to question our character. How 
even for you, um, oh, and I'm sorry if I'm cutting you off. I have just 500 million things to ask you about when I'm getting the time check. I'm going, we'll just keep going. Stop it <laughs> from the producer. Um, even for you, Dr. Wang, I think one of the things that you shared is even I as you are not a member of the trans community, but you are doing this work, that you still sometimes are having to approach some of the blind spots that you've had. Where do you find the courage to step into that and own that? I mean, I think being in medicine where we're, we're given quite the privilege to learn a, about, a, 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 we get to, we're privileged to learn a lot about our patients and I think, and I don't, know, I don't know if this is too hokey and, I'm, I, and I hope Maddie doesn't start laughing at me in a little bit, but um, I think that the, the, where I find the courage is really just from our, our patients and our communities, right? I tend to be somebody who, I, you know, I, I'm not the most outspoken person out there, but it's people such as Maddie and the patients I get to see in my clinic who are putting themselves out there every single day who are going against everything we were, the environments of which we grew up, right? Going against all the cisgender, heterosexual, white majority norms and to say, I, um, I, I, I am willing to do this because this is my authentic self. So the, where I find my courage is if I, have my, if I have patients who are putting themselves out there, then it is my job and my responsibility to put myself out there and to own my own mistakes so I can support um, my patients living their true lives. Yes, yes. Um, I'm going to go a little bit off script here because I'm actually seeing questions coming through from our community. Carlos, I'm so putting you on the spot. Carlos Chavez is one of our producers from the GSBA. Carlos, can you read out some of those questions from our community members? Uh, sure thing. Uh, we've got a question that says, uh, I'm a healthcare provider. What are some comforting symbols and signs for trans folks when they step into a healthcare office? I think one of the main ones is knowing that the forms or um, the paperwork that they'll have to fill out are gender affirming, um, that um, there are uh, expansive genders on the forms and it's not just male or female. Um, that folks will get to use their their chosen name as opposed to um, their name given at birth. Um, that um, that there's a, a level of privacy. Um, we've had um, folks come into Ingersoll and share that they've been sitting in their doctor's office um, and they've shared that their their chosen name is is this name and and yet and told that that would be respected and then their their dead name is called out um you know and you know they're kind of just looking looking around seeing you know um and I, th I think that that is something that folks can can uh, be aware of i think that providers specifically can um can defer to the patient as to what names and what terms for different body parts um, the patient would like to use. Um, I think that providers can uh, provide care from a very trauma-informed approach. Um, mm. I think that, oh goodness, uh, what else? <laughs> Anything, do you have anything else, Kennedy? Keep dancing yeah. until you. I don't. By the way, your your dancing is amazing. Um, I think for me, in, you know, it's interesting because there, there there's a difference between I'm going to put a whole bunch of flags and signs, mm -hmm. and I want people to know I'm inclusive, versus um, the you know having laying down the groundwork for having a, uh, an inclusive visit. And so, yeah, you can have the flags, you can have the magazines, you can, um, but what Maddie said is putting, putting those signs and symbols into practice. So having registration forms, which are, are gender inclusive and sexuality inclusive, it even starts with just, because the first point of contact every time is going to be the person who answers the phone. Mm -hmm. And so 
you could have, you know, someone calls and, you, and I can say, hi, this is Kevin Wang from Swedish Family Medicine First Hill and I use he, him pronouns. How may I help you today? Mm -hmm. Right. And mm -hmm. it's, the, it's, it's those kind of covert, you know, maybe covert for people who aren't in the LGBT plus community. But for us, it's that's, this is the sign I'm looking for, where this is the clinic I want to go. Right. And then as Maddie can, uh, Maddie, you're just perfect. Um, it's even, it's even in the clinical setting, right? Where if I'm going to be talking with a patient and I'm meeting a person who wants to start hormonal therapy for the first time, it's, I'm going to ask them, how would you like me to address you today? Are you okay with me using medical terminology to refer to your anatomy or would you want me to address it in a different manner? Um, and it's all of those kind of nuanced questions which will be even more effective than symbols and signs to hang up in your office. Because the moment one person has the best experience in your office, the floodgates will open and people will want to see you, Stacey Schwartz, as the provider of choice for the trans community in Seattle. Also asking for consent before you touch, uh, touch people is, is uh, so important, so important. Um, uh, and also a part of being trauma informed. Uh, I cannot tell you how many people um, are just incredibly um, harmed when providers kind of assume that, that this is a visit. I can kind of do whatever I need to to your body um, and that you don't need to consent to that. Um, please, please, if you're going to be touching um, anything, any body part, um, please ask for consent before you do that. Um, it's so important. And I feel like it's something that's so often overlooked um, yes. in providing care. And in, in care in general, right? That we would like to say that that would be assumed. You know, I was had to take my son to the doctor recently and it was one of those moments where I was like, yes, proud parent moment where my son said to the doctor, please ask before you touch me. Yes, you know, and so uh, not that that's the same, but I just uh, needed to put in their proud parent moment. What for that young person who's sitting out there watching now, listening now, what do you want them to hear about the next time that they go to the doctor, to any experience where they've normally felt uncomfortable, been made to feel uncomfortable, what do you want them to hear? What do you want them to know? I would tell them, um, to all of the baby transes out there, um, to one, give these doctors hell, um, don't make it easy for them. Um, they're getting paid. The, they're getting paid the big bucks to take care of you, and so um, give them hell to get the the care that you deserve. Um, I think be assertive. Um, if you feel like you can't be assertive or um, you're nervous, bring a friend or other support person to your appointments. Um, if you feel like you might have trouble advocating for yourself. Um, before your appointment, write down all of your concerns and make sure that in your appointment that your provider answers all of them um, and don't leave um, until they answer all of them. Um, ask questions when you don't understand a treatment or a procedure um, and keep asking them um, about explaining that to you until you do. Um, you do not need to teach your doctor how to treat you. They should already know. And if they don't, leave. Um, and call me um, so I can find you someone who does know. Um, mm. Or better yet, go see Dr. Kevin at Swedish First Hill Family Medicine. Um, they're amazing and their staff is amazing. Um, I always hear the best and funniest uh, and greatest stories from uh, community members who go there. So. Yeah, that's what I would I would tell them. Maddie said it perfect. I don't know if I have anything else to add, other than there are lots of providers out there caring for <laughs> our trans adolescents. There are, and I can let you know who those folks are. So give me a call. <laughs> Maddie knows it all. Hello.
<laughs> I think if anything in this episode, what my hope was that um, two sides that uh, those who presume to be allies to the trans community, and I love this term to uh, trans babies, that we can confront our own biases and stand in that knowingly so that we might learn, so that we might grow, so that um, if the trans community decides to call us an ally, we might uh, endeavor to earn such a mantle. Mm -hmm. And on the other side, making sure that um, anyone out there, trans babies, trans community members that are watching, that they might feel seen, might feel heard. Are there any final thoughts you want to leave us with today, Maddie? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I know one of the questions was, what advice would you give young medical students uh, who want to be aware and sensitive of their treatment of trans patients? Um, and for this, I would say, um, do your research and learn all you can before you start seeing patients so that you aren't traumatizing and harming trans folks uh, who come in to see you. Um, it's also nobody's responsibility to make sure that you're able to provide gender affirming care, uh, but your own. Um, and certainly not enough medical schools are teaching trans competency, but um, they're still able to read, research, talk to doctors already providing gender affirming care, uh, find a residency program that provides instruction uh, about providing quality gender affirming care. And last but not least, and probably the most important is never think that you know more about your trans patient's body or experience than they do. Mm. 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 Um. And I think I'm gonna take a quote from Maddie, which is, if you're a medical student or whether you're any kind of health profession student, give the administration hell until you get what you need from them to provide, the, to, to get the best education possible to provide care to whatever population you wanna serve, particularly when it comes to the queer and trans community. Um, don't take no for an answer. Mm -hmm. And you know, in addition to everything, all the perfect things Maddie just said, I do also just want to say some or repeat something which was said to me, which is to be an ally, it is not something you self designate. Yes. The title ally is something you earn. And yes. um, I don't know if Maddie was it, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's somebody Maddie like, but um, it, it was something which, which was, um, which was a, a really impactful statement to me. And to, um, to, to maybe expand a little bit more on what Maddie said, it is so important to lay the groundwork and the foundation to set up an inclusive environment before you start hanging anything on, on, on your clinic or medical school or residency training, because you may know how to do something and what to do, but if you don't know the why, then you mm -hmm. are gonna be asking for a world of hurt. Mm -hmm. So take the time for process and personal and professional improvement before you consider doing anything. Because the last thing you want to do is have do any sort of unintended consequence, such mm -hmm. as trauma, re-traumatizing your patient. So thank you, Maddie, for, for those words. Yes, yeah, start with the I work, always. Maddie Mooney, Dr. Kevin Wang, um, we're going to continue this party without these other people because I'm enjoying this love fest happening between the two of you and I'm gonna just take that into the rest of the day, but let's hang up on these other people first. Uh, thank you for joining me on the virtual couch to keep it real. Thank you to the GSBA. I'm your host, Lindsay T.H. Jackson, and we'll see you next week. Thank you.